Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to another AP Calculus Review Lesson starring Mr. Birdo. But more importantly, starring you, the students, who everything is all about. Um, look, it's Monday, okay? Your AP is not tomorrow, which is Tuesday, but it is the next Tuesday, okay? So we're getting very, very close. Um, I know you probably got a hundred things going on with other AP exams and whatnot. Just to speak a little bit about this one, I know you guys have been completing the take-home assignments. Thank you so much uh, for doing that, by the way. Really, you should just be thanking yourself. Um, it's really going to help you out on the AP exam. You might have noticed that there are some difficult parts of problems, okay? Remember what we spoke about in class? You're not supposed to get everything right on the advanced placement exam. So, and, and especially with your AP exam that you're going to be given, okay? You're going to be given two problems, all right? One is supposed to be a normal length uh, part two problem, like we've been practicing. Those are 15 minutes. That's usually what you want to average. And then they give you five minutes to upload. I think that's the second problem, actually. Um, you know, the first problem is going to be a little bit longer, 25 minutes. But they say it's going to be like other AP part twos in the past. So I'm assuming it's going to be something like this, um, just with a couple more, uh, you know, actual steps. Okay. Usually AP problems are only two parts up to four parts. Maybe you have like eight parts or something. Maybe there's some short answer. Okay. Especially with today's lesson, going to go through some miscellaneous types of problems. But there's a problem you have to do for homework, the 2012 problem. This one right here. It's actually extremely simple. Just gives you a function. S for the function is derivative, equation of a tangent line. Check for continuity, doing a definite integral. I would not be surprised if you saw a problem that half of it was like this, where it's just doing a bunch of short answer, okay? A way to definitely get you guys to focus on derivatives and integrals right here. Because um, those are normally part one types of problems, but you're not going to see part one on your AP. Okay, so I'm going to try to predict some stuff this week. You know, I think we'll have some short answer like that. Make sure you do your homework. Make sure you try these problems. Uh, remember, there are going to be parts that you can't do. Okay, they specifically said, even for this AP exam, to discourage cheating. There might be a bunch of parts on a problem that you can't actually handle. Don't freak out. Okay, just skip to the parts that you could do. Get those points. Then look at the stuff that you're not so sure on. Do what you could do to earn some points, okay? Try to remain calm. That demo should be out today. It was already out for teachers uh, um, last week. I'm making this video on Saturday. I haven't had a chance to test the demo yet. I'm going to test it probably today, later today or tomorrow. Maybe make a video on it at some point. But you guys got to go test the demo, you know, right now. Um, if you want to upload responses in picture form, which is what you're going to have to do. Like, there's no way you're going to be able to type. You could download some software that will help you cal uh, type out calculate stu uh, calculus stuff. But it's not going to be easy if you haven't practiced it. And it's hard to be like, hey, I want to draw an arrow over here and look at this and da da da. You know, stuff like that is going to be very difficult to do while typing. So the best option for you to take the AP exam is probably a smartphone or a tablet because if you do it on the smartphone or you do it on the tablet you could just take a picture of your work and then you just hit a button and you can immediately you know upload from your pictures on the tablet or the phone but that's tough i get it you know a big problem like this having to zoom in to see it with the smartphone and when you take a picture don't do it in landscape mode do it in portrait mode the normal mode um which you guys have been doing when you're sending me solutions anyway so i get it that's going to be tough to actually look at the problem and you want the AP experience to be as, as comfortable for you as possible. So another option is for you to use a laptop, okay, or a desktop, and then take a, a picture of your response. Then you could have to email it to yourself, okay? And then you could actually upload that picture from the email, which I don't think is really too terrible. Um, if you're computer savvy, which you guys should be pretty good with, you should practice those things, okay? In other classes, you're probably just typing it out, but they said specifically in chem, stats, and calculus, you're probably gonna wanna upload pictures of solutions, okay? So try it with your smartphone and also try it with a desktop or a laptop. See which option is the best for you, okay? I play around with it myself a little bit, um, but really, it's going to come down to you on the day of the AP exam. Make sure in a nice, quiet place as well when you take it. Who knows if they're going to have issues or not, okay, with bandwidth, you know, and things like that. Uh, you know, make sure nobody's using, you know, the, the internet in your house. But even all these people trying to upload, you know, uh, solutions at the same time, who knows if they're going to have trouble, okay? If they have, if they do have trouble, you can't upload your responses. They tell you you're allowed to take the, the, the retake of the AP, I think it's sometime in early June. Um, but we want to try to avoid that if possible. Anyway, let's jump into some problems here, okay? So just trying to do some different types of problems. This one right here, not so easy from last year's AP. It's got a little piece it with L'Hopital's rule in it. I'm telling you right now, I bet you're going to see L'Hopital's rule on your AP exam, okay? It's a good way to get limits involved in a part two type of problem, so I would not be surprised if they threw that at you. They tell you about functions F, G, and H, so we got three functions here that are twice differentiable. 
That's nice, okay? Remember, if they're twice differentiable, it means they're differentiable. It means they're also very good. Continuous, they tell us g of 2 is equal to h of 2, which is equal to 4. And they tell you this line right here, they kind of have it written out in a strange way, is tangent to not just g, but also h at x equals 2. So they really tell you a lot more about uh, g and h than they do about f, okay? But, you know, let's dive right in. They want h prime of 2. You know, and that's difficult, right? H prime of 2, people are like, well, they didn't give me H. How am I supposed to take the derivative, you know, and plug in 2? Well, they actually told you the line that was tangent to H, okay, at X equals 2. So here we have Y is equal to 4 plus, what do we got? 2 thirds times the quantity X minus 2. We know that's tangent to H. So tangent to H at x equals 2, which means, you know, remember, if you wanted to get the equation of the tangent line, the first thing you do is get the slope of the tangent line, <laughs> slope of the tangent line, um, and the slope of the tangent line, that means take the derivative, okay? So if you actually want the slope of the line tangent to h at x equals 2, that's h prime of 2, and that's what we're looking for, okay? And it's just the slope of this line right here, you know, to get the slope, if you're good, you can see the slope is two-thirds right here. If you remember the point-slope formula, if you put this in point-slope form, we had one of those on the part one that we just did. Then you can see the slope is actually equal to two-thirds, okay? You know, so really that means h prime of two is two-thirds. If you don't like it, you could distribute, you know, you can go to y is equal to, leave the four over here, distribute the positive two-thirds, so positive two-thirds x, um, and then minus, you know, two-thirds times two, so four-thirds. Okay, so you can even write it up as two-thirds x. You don't even need to combine these, plus four, minus four-thirds. We can see that this is the m that we're looking for right there. So two different ways to say that h prime of two is equal to two-thirds. Got to be creative with it, okay? You know, they don't actually give you the function to take the derivative of it and plug in a number. They give you the equation of the line tangent, but we know the slope is going to be hidden inside that tangent line. So that one right there, you really had to think about, okay? It wasn't too... Um, you know, like kind of uh, traditional as far as problems are concerned. B is probably the most traditional part of this problem. They define a new function A, like we didn't have enough, right? We had three functions here. They define A of X, and they tell us it's equal to 3X cubed, and then it's slightly abstract, right? It has H of X, <clears throat> excuse me, has H of X in it. They want an expression for A prime of X, and then they want A prime of 2. So they go hand in hand, right? If we get A prime of X, we could just take out the X, replace it with the 2 to get A prime of 2. And look, to take this derivative here, this is 3x cubed. <clears throat> Excuse me. I oh, know it's wrong. I'm like drooling in my mouth here. This is 3x cubed connected to another function, h of x by multiplication. Oh, I know why I'm drooling. It's product rule. Product rule makes me drool. So look, abstract differentiation. We practice this. You should be good at this. How does product rule start? Back in. All right, the second function is h of x times the derivative of the first, which we know is 9x squared plus the first, which we know is uh, 3x cubed, times the derivative of the second, which is going to be h prime of x. Look at the way I wrote these up, you know, no parentheses in the first one, parentheses in the second one. That just looked disgusting right there. It really wasn't wrong, technically. Um, you know, I used to tell my students on the AP exam, don't be screaming out, back in, when you think about the product rule or something like that, you know, think about it in your head, or like, you know, when you're like, that's where I draw the line, like you stomp or something like that. You know, I always told them, don't do that during the AP test because you could distract other students, but now you're going to be at home, okay? So as long as your family is prepared for you taking this AP test and be like, this is where I draw the line, the A prime line, back in, like screaming stuff like that out. You know, as stupid as it seems, that's going to alleviate, okay, some stress during the situation. You want it to be a stressless situation during the AP exam. If you start getting stressed out, and you will get stressed out, move on to the next part of the problem, okay? You know, I want you to fake being confident if you need to. You know, fake the confidence. You think all the great leaders in the world, you know, were confident every time they thought of, of something? No, but they acted like they were, okay? And if you act confident, you'd be surprised. Your body's going to be like, oh, you know what? I'm the man. I'm the woman, whatever, okay? And I'm going to rock and roll, and you will not stress you will not cry you will not freak out until after the advanced placement exam and you could text me and remind i hate you mr birdo i knew nothing there's no way i did well in the exam because that's what everybody tells me afterward even though they end up doing quite well okay and i'm sure you guys will be the same by the way write an expression for a prime of x look at this disgusting stuff here i didn't even write a prime of x i just wrote a of x horrible on the ap exam but here's the expression that they're looking for okay let's box that in you don't need to simplify it now if you want a prime of two just replace every x with a 2, okay? So that's going to be h of 2 times 9 times 2 squared, okay, plus 3 times 2 cubed times h prime of 2. 
All right, so look, we have to be able to actually get what, what certain things are equal to, like right here, you know, h of two. You can't leave it as h of two. You got to replace it. We know what it's equal to, okay? You know, we actually, it's actually equal to four over here. What you don't need to do is actually compute nine times two squared. You could just leave that there, all right? Because that's computation. This is functional computation. You got to be able to tell them what h of two is. Just like over here, leave the three times the two cubed. And then h prime of two, we actually already got, and we got that that was two thirds, okay? So make sure you don't simplify in the AP exam, especially yours, okay? You're always gonna be stressing for time. When you do these problems, when you do these practice problems, 15 minutes a piece, okay? Time yourself, don't take extra time, okay? And you're gonna have extra time in the AP, five minutes to upload, but if you go beyond that five minutes, you're not gonna be able to upload your solution. So don't be like, ooh, I'll take an extra two minutes if it only takes me three minutes to upload. Be very careful with stuff like that, A and B got to be able to do okay because c is where things get filthy and then d gets rough as well they tell you the function h so actually satisfies this uh you know expression right here so i actually know what h of x is equal to it's partially abstract it's in terms of f as you can see um for x not equal to two okay so it has a domain x not equal to two it is known that the limit as uh x approaches two of h of x can be evaluated using l'hopital's rule they want you to use that fact, the limit is uh, x approaches 2 of h of x, to find f of 2 and to find f prime of 2, okay, and to show the work that leads to your answers. So we know that we have h of x equal to this expression right here. It's also known that this limit can be evaluated using L'Hopital's rule. So they're saying the limit as x approaches 2 of h of x, which is x squared minus 4, over 1 minus f of x quantity cubed, can be evaluated using L'Hopital's rule. Remember what it means to evaluate a limit using L'Hopital's rule. That means you plug into the top, you plug into the bottom, and you end up getting zero over zero. I've been reading up some stuff. They don't like these days for you to put equals zero over zero. And I always usually put an error or anything because technically you're not supposed to be equal to zero over zero because that's indeterminate. It doesn't equal anything. They want you to do this, okay, and show you that, look, by L'Hopital's rule, when you take the limit of a quotient, and you get zero over zero, that means you can take the derivative of the top, the derivative of the bottom, and evaluate the limit again. So they're saying you can evaluate this limit using L'Hopital's rule. So I know when I plug two into the top, I'm going to get zero, which is obvious. But I also know when I plug two into the bottom, I'm going to get zero. So I know one minus not f of x quantity cubed, but f of two quantity cubed has to be equal to zero. And that's what's going to enable us to actually solve for f of two. Okay, right here, you know, add uh, f of two quantity cubed to both sides cube root both sides okay it's really nice over here because the cube root of one is just going to be equal to one so i know that one is actually equal to f of two all right so everybody should actually be able to do that piece of the problem i know it's not the easiest thing in the world okay you know my daughter's screaming and yelling upstairs somebody's throwing a tantrum it's the witching hour anyway i know it's not the easiest thing in the world to do but remember if you could evaluate a limit using l'hopital's rule that means when you plug into the top and you plug into the bottom you get zero over zero, okay? And the other thing that means is that now, to actually apply L'Hopital's rule, well, that means you could actually take the derivative of the top, I'll do it over here, and the derivative of the bottom separately, then reevaluate the limit. So I know if I take the derivative of x squared minus four, I get two x over, not so easy to take this derivative down here, the derivative of one is zero, minus the derivative of f of x quantity cubed, that's a chain rule situation, the outside function is x cubed, drop the three down like he's hot, rewrite the f of x, raise them to the one less, and then multiply by the derivative of the inside, okay, and I know that you can actually evaluate the limit that way. And it's kind of tough because you don't know what the limit is equal to. And here's where stuff gets a little crunchy, okay? But basically, they told you that um, F, G, and H were twice differentiable functions, okay? So I know that H is differentiable. H is differentiable. So it is continuous. So it is continuous. Continuous. Okay, and remember, if h is continuous, well, we're talking about x equals 2, right? So if h is continuous and x equals 2, what does that mean? That means the limit as x approaches 2 of h of x is equal to h of 2, okay? There's no difference between the y value the h is approaching and the y value h gets to at x equals 2. And you know h of 2. They told you it was 4. So essentially, they're telling you the limit as x approaches 2 of h of x is equal to 4, okay? So they're actually giving you this limit telling you it's equal to four. Okay, not the easiest thing in the world, but that actually gives us now an equation that we could solve. Okay, remember, if you plug in two top and bottom here, you're supposed to get an answer of four. So what does that do? If I plug in a two top, I get four. Downstairs, if I plug in a two, remember downstairs, we got negative three f of x quantity squared uh, times f prime of x. So plug in a two to that. So negative three 
f of 2 quantity squared times f prime of 2. And I know that's going to be equal to 4, okay? And the problem is, to solve this right here, well, we want to solve for f prime of 2. That's what we want. And we know f of 2. We just got that it was 1. So we know 4 over negative 3 times 1 squared times f prime of 2 is going to be equal to 4. So that really gives us 4 over negative 3 f prime of 2 is equal to 4, and I'll put the 4 over 1, and get a little cross multiplication going, okay? You know, and here I get that 4 is equal to negative uh, 3 times 4, so negative 12, f prime of 2, which means if I divide by negative 12 on both sides, you could even say 4 divided by negative 12 is equal to f prime of 2, okay? It's not necessary to say that that's equal to, uh, what, negative 1 third there? You know, you could if you want to, but it's not necessary. Hopefully that wasn't cut off there as I was talking. Not easy, okay? Part C. Maybe you could just get this, okay? And then maybe after that, you're like, what in good heck are they talking about? But remember L'Hopital's rule. Be ready for it. It's going to show up in one of your homework problems. Um, you know, if you evaluate the limit of a quotient and you get that the top goes to zero, the bottom goes to zero, take the dirt of the top and the bottom separately, then reevaluate the limit. You know, then part D here gets really filthy, even though it's not too difficult, but it's not so easy either. It is known, it is known that G of X is less than H of X uh, from one to three. And then they say, let K be a function. So now they introduce another function. Okay, a fourth function here. Let K be a function satisfying. I think it's a fifth function, right? Because we've got A of X over here already. Let K be a function satisfying. K is in between G of X and H of X, okay, from one to three. And they want to know if K is continuous at X equals two, okay, and justify your answer. So if K is going to be continuous at X equals two, Okay, remember what that means? Okay, that means the limit as x approaches 2 of k of x has to equal k of 2. Okay, so I need to get this limit. I need to get k of 2. Well, they told you that g of x is less than or equal to k of x, which is less than or equal to h of x. All right, so if you actually plug in a 2 here, I want k of 2. You know, what this is going to signify is that, you know, k of 2 is greater than or equal to g of 2 but it's less than or equal to h of 2. And the thing is, you know what g of 2 is equal to. You know what h of 2 is equal to. You know they're both equal to 4. So this is telling you 4 less than or equal to k of 2, less than or equal to 4. I was writing h of 2 again. My bad. Okay. Less than or equal to 4. And look, this is saying that, you know, k of 2 is either in between 4 and 4 or equal to 4 and 4. This implies right here that k of 2 is equal to four, okay, you know, so that actually gives us this piece right here, and now you got to get the limit, and the limit is actually something we did earlier in the year, we did something known as the squeeze theorem, okay, and basically it states this, if you know that g of x is less than or equal to k of x is less than or equal to h of x, you could take the limit of each of these, and this inequality will still remain true, okay, so we want the limit as x approaches two here, you could say the limit as x approaches two of g of x is less than or equal to the limit as x approaches 2 of k of x, which is less than or equal to the limit as x approaches 2 of h of x. And you could actually evaluate these two outside limits. So, okay, the limit as x approaches 2 of g of x is g of 2. All right, less than or equal to the limit as x approaches 2 of k of x, less than or equal to h of 2, okay, right? You just plug in that 2 right there to evaluate the limit. And once again, we know g of 2 and h of 2. We know that they're equal to 4. And this is really the squeeze theorem right here. You don't need to actually quote it. Okay, but look, if, um, you know, the limit as x approaches 2 of k of x has to be in between, or, uh, you know, the limit as x approaches 2 of g of x and the limit as x approaches 2 of h of x, if those two limits are 4, that means the limit as x approaches 2 of k of x has to equal 4, okay? So that means that over here, we know that 4 is equal to 4, you know, and they want to know right here, is k continuous at x equals 2? So thus, k is continuous at x equals 2. You know, and look, it gets filthy, okay? And right now you might be like, what the heck is going on, Berto? I don't know what's happening. Oh my goodness, you know, remember this problem, A and B, totally doable, okay? You can get all the points for A and B right there, and you can easily get half of C right here, okay? And then after that, it does get rough, getting F prime of two, even though it's not as bad as you might think. And then part D, not the easiest thing in the world. First time something like this showed up, so I don't know if you'll see a squeeze theorem type of situation uh, on your AP. It hadn't shown up on the AP um, pretty much ever since the AP had come out. 
something that you could teach in class. You know, I, I did teach it to you this year. Usually I don't even go through it because it's a lot of stuff to go through for one thing that perhaps is going to be on the AP exam. But anyway, uh, there's that problem right there. Um, on your AP, you know, there's always six problems, free response on the AP besides the multiple choice. On your AP, you only have two free response. There was always one of the six free response problems that was almost impossible that people couldn't do and could hardly get any points on. That's going to be rolled in to your AP exam, okay? So at some point, I told you, you're going to see, I don't know, maybe they got eight points to eight parts to that first problem. Maybe the first four are kind of normal and the last four are rough. You know, maybe you're going for a three or a lower level four, something like that. You might be skipping the whole half of the problem. You could probably skip an entire problem and possibly also still get a five on this AP exam, depending. Okay, so look, you know, about 40% of the exam right gets you a three. You know, around 55, 60% of the exam right gets you a four. And 65% of the exam right, that's going to give you your five right there. Okay, so you're not supposed to feel confident during this exam. Do the best you can. Earn points. Let's take a look at the 2017 problem. Really cool problem because it talks about f being a function defined algebraically right here. Then they say g is a differentiable function, and then they give you values of g and g prime tabally, right, numerically. Then they talk about h, and they give you h graphically. How amazing is that? Okay, three ways to represent a function, algebraically, graphically, and tabally, and they give you them all in this problem right here. Part a is a joke. Find the slope of the line tangent to the graph of f that x equals pi, so we have to slope of the tangent line, that means take the derivative, okay? So we need f prime of x. Got to be able to take this derivative right here. Cosine 2x is derivative. Remember, that's negative sine 2x, a little chain rule action, times 2. Okay, plus the derivative e to the sine x, more chain rule, e to the sine x times the derivative sine x, which is cosine x. And that right there, I want f prime of what, pi? All right, you can plug right in, okay? You could say, um, you know, negative sine of 2 pi times 2 plus e to the sine pi times the cosine of pi. And if I were you, I'd leave it right there. You don't even need to evaluate trig expressions on the AP exam. Now, sometimes you need to use this answer later on. And you do need to actually use this answer later on. You know, maybe you don't realize it yet. Maybe you just jump into part B because here's what you're going to be doing when you take the test. Let K be the function defined by abstract function. We saw one in the problem that we just did. I'm telling you, they're going to throw abstract stuff at you somewhere in your part two on your AP exam. So K of X is equal to this guy right here. H of F of X. It's a composite function. And they want you to find H prime, K prime, pardon me, of pi. Remember, K prime of X. This is a chain rule situation right here. When you want to take the derivative of a function with another function inside of it, take the derivative of the outside function, rewrite the inside function. Remember, a function means nothing without its argument. Very good. And now the derivative of the inside function, multiply by that, f prime of x. And now if you want to know what, what k prime of pi is equal to, well, now we know it's just h, h prime of f of pi times f prime of pi. Now, here's the problem. Uh, you can't leave it in this form and just circle it because there are functions that need to be actually evaluated here, okay? So we're going to leave this right here as h prime of. Now we got to get what f of pi is equal to, okay? So f of pi, got to plug back in f of x. Technically, you know, here we get what? Cosine of 2 pi plus e to the sine of pi. And I'm not going to lie, okay? You could put that right inside here. You don't need to actually simplify it. But then you're going to want to do h prime of that number, which means you're going to want the slope of the line tangent to the graph of h at that number. And if you don't know what that number is, you're going to be in trouble. So you don't need to simplify in the AP exam, but it can help. I mean, you know, cosine 2 pi, you got to know what the cosine of 2 pi is equal to. Okay, 2 pi is over here. We know the cosine of 2 pi, we know is going to be equal to 1. Don't forget about my famous impersonation of the cosine curve. Uh, so cosine of 2 pi is equal to 1 plus e to the sine pi. Remember what sine pi is equal to. Okay, pi is right in the middle here. So the sine of pi is 0, so it's really e to the 0. So really, we just get 2 right there. Okay, and even for this f prime of pi, you could take this whole nasty thing and put it right here. You would not be wrong, but if you want, you could simplify it down if it's not too terrible. So this is negative of sine of 2 pi. The sine of 2 pi is equal to 0, so it's just really negative 0 times 2, and then plus uh, e to the sine of 0, so e to the 0. So this really just becomes 1 right there. Okay, so something that you could do. Uh, is it positive 1 or is it negative 1? Why do I feel like it's, it's negative 1? Oh, times the cosine of pi. I totally forgot about that over there. Okay, so my apologies. Plus uh, e to the zero times the cosine of pi, which is negative one. 
right? Cosine of pi over here going to be negative one. And that's why it gives us a zero plus one times negative one. So it gives us negative one to put right there. But you don't really need to do that. You can put this whole expression right here in parentheses if you want to. It's more important to get f of pi because now h prime of 2, you want the slope of, of the graph of h at x equals 2. And x equals 2, if you look at the graph of h, slope of the line tangent, you can't draw the tangent line, which is good. Just means it's a linear, okay? So to get the slope, we'll use average rate of change. This point right here is, uh, what, 3 comma negative 1. And this point right here is the origin where it all began. So negative 1 minus 0 over 3 minus 0. Okay, times your negative 1. That's it right there. That's actually h prime of uh, k prime of pi, pi, like we were saying. This right here is really negative one third times negative one, which gives you one third, but it's not necessary to simplify it. You probably want to simplify this f of pi. So, you know, you do h prime of two. So that way you know what value of x you're getting the slope of h at because you kind of need that. But you didn't need this negative one. You could have took this entire expression in parentheses and put it right there. Wouldn't be anything wrong with that. So a and b are really not too terrible. They're pretty doable. C gets more abstract because C, we now have M of X and they tell us it's equal to G of negative Twix um, times H of X. And they want us to find uh, M prime of two. Okay, so they want us to actually take, where is it? M prime of two, take the, <laughs> the derivative here, straight up product rule type of situation. Okay, you know, M prime of uh, X over here going to be equal to, back end, which we know is H of X. That's the second function times the derivative of the first, the derivative of g of negative 2x, that's g prime of, rewrite the inside, negative 2x, multiply by the derivative of the inside, chain rule action, plus the first function, g of negative 2x, times the derivative of the second, which is just h prime of x, okay? You know, so a little complicated taking the, the derivative abstractly there, but we practice stuff like that, and they want n prime of what, 2? m prime of 2 is going to be equal to, so we know it's h of 2 right here, times g prime of what, negative four, right? Uh, times negative two, don't forget that. Did I close up this parenthesis a bit early? Looks like I did. Okay, so you know, you might wanna have one of these on hand at the AP exam, if you're using pen, okay? If you're using pencil, certainly you don't need it. Make sure when you take your pictures, okay, that they're actually legible. Right, that's going to be important as well. You've been sending me pictures. For the most part, it's pretty good. Tristan Morlock, work on your handwriting. Hey, so anyway, now we have g of, uh, what, negative 4 again. That was g prime and negative 4, actually. And then we have h prime of 2. And you can't leave it like this. you got to evaluate these things, okay? You can't leave it in function notation. h of 2, we already got at some point. Didn't we already get h of 2? No, maybe we didn't, okay? Um, so h of 2... You know, if you take a look over here, oh, h of 2 is actually going to be this value right here. That's pretty filthy, too, okay? So h of 2, what are we going to do? Just guesstimate that right there? Or do we have to actually set up? You know, here's what you could do, okay? You know, it's pretty filthy right here for h of 2. Um, remember, with no calculator, which you don't have here, you could guesstimate. It's usually a little bit easier if it's, uh, you know, like a, a one half or something like that. You know, if this is at negative one half, it is at negative two thirds. Uh, let's talk about how you're supposed to do it. If I were you, I'd just guesstimate, you know, and get what it is because this is going to take a little bit too long. But really, um, you know, the equation of this line right here, you know, that it's just y equals mx plus b. And you already know m, you already know the slope. Okay, you got it. That was the h prime of two that we got before. And we got that to be equal to negative one third, right? This guy down here. Okay, and then we know b, by the way, here's x. We know b is equal to zero. You can see the y-intercept is zero. So this is really the equation of this little piece of the function. So if you want to get h of two, you just plug a two into this. So like we'll put y of two here and you get a uh, negative one third times two plus zero. So that's negative two thirds. That's a little extra right there, okay? If you see what I wrote. So I wouldn't freak out so much about that. Um, I just really guesstimate and be like, it looks like negative two thirds. So it is negative two thirds. Usually it's like a negative one half or something like that. Usually it's something a little bit easier to see. That one wasn't quite so easy. Whatever, okay? If you need to make something up, make something up. Or do it this way. It's actually not that bad, but it is a little time consuming. This one's not too terrible because the y intercept was zero. It was pretty obvious right there. And we had already gotten the slope, so it really wasn't bad. G prime of negative four, finally going over here to the chart. Okay, G prime of negative four, we can see is equal to negative one. Okay, plus a G of negative four, we can go to the chart. G of negative four, I know is equal to uh, five over here times h prime of two and h prime of two actually already got is negative one third and that 
you can leave, okay? You know, because now there's just computation that's actually left. So there's a lot of extra things going on here, you know, besides abstractly taking the derivative, then you have to evaluate these derivatives in different ways, you know, evaluate the derivative by a table, evaluate the derivative by a graph, evaluate the derivative algebraically. It's a really cool type of problem here. Then they jump into part D. All right, and they say, is uh, there a number C in the closed interval negative five to negative three such that G prime of C is equal to negative four? This is going to show up on your AP exam as well, I'm telling you. You know, here they're telling you that a slope has to be equal to a number. If it just said G of C is negative four, that's the intermediate value theorem. If they tell you Y value has to be equal to something, remember, a function's got to be continuous for the intermediate value theorem. It's got to take on all Y values from one point to another point. That's not this, okay? Here they're saying the slope is equal to negative four, the slope of the tangent line. If they're forcing a slope to be equal to something, that's the mean value theorem, okay? And by the way, they're talking about G here, right? G prime of C equal to negative four. They tell you that G is a differentiable function. So remember, for the mean value theorem to work, function needs to be differentiable. It also needs to be continuous, but it is continuous if it's differentiable. So, you know, we're going to say that, you know, G is differentiable, thus it is continuous, you know, and then we could say by the mean value theorem, remember, g prime of c is going to be equal to g of b minus g of a over b minus a. Usually do it with f, okay? We could do it with g, no big deal here. They want that g prime of c to actually be equal to negative 4. So you want to see if there's a place where we can actually get this average rate of change equal to negative four. And, you know, it's not so easy to do. Like if you want it equal to zero, then you want to look up here and find places where G is the same. So then you can get that the top is equal to zero. But that's not the, the case here. We want this thing to equal negative four. Always try the values they give you first. They say from negative five to negative three. That means it, you might find somewhere in between negative five and negative three. It might be negative five to negative four, might be negative four to negative three, but start from negative five to negative three and you'll actually see if you do G of negative three minus G of negative five over negative three minus negative five, you get two minus 10, which is negative eight over negative three minus negative five, which is really negative three uh, plus five, which is equal to two, which equals negative four, which is what we're looking for. So really you could just go right into saying, hey, G prime of C, Try the values they give you. Sometimes the values they give you, the ones they work. Sometimes it's ones that are in between. But I'm going to say, um, you know, G of B minus G of A. So G of negative 3 minus G of negative 5 over negative 3 minus negative 5. And then you're going to see that G prime of C is equal to, get the values uh, right here, which we already got. So that was uh, 2 minus 10 over uh, 2, like we said before. So negative 8 divided by 2 is going to be negative four. Okay, so we're really right here showing that there is that number C where G prime of C is equal to negative four. Still, not so easy, but also doable. This one's a lot more doable than the one that we did right here. Okay, this was a tough problem without a doubt. You know, they're usually on the AP, there's one or two problems that are like nine out of niners. You know, you'll get all the points or some people certainly can. I don't really think you'll see that in your AP. Okay, both problems are probably going to be a disaster, but there's going to be pieces inside that you can do. Please, your homework, this 2012 problem, it's so important for you to look through, okay? It's very easy to do, okay? You know, I, I, when they came out with it, I was like, my God, this is a part two problem. This is a joke right here compared to other ones that we've done. Do the best you can. Try it. Uh, probably part C is the toughest part right there. Um, even that, I don't think it's really too terrible. Um, I think you're going to see something like this. I do, like a short answer, you know, uh, like half of the, the one of the part two problems, just a bunch of kind of short answer pieces like this where they just tell you to do some basic things. I think you're going to see that. This problem right here is a lot tougher. Okay, a little bit of trig involved. Uh, a and B are actually really easy. Part C is where the disaster commences. So do the best you can on that. Try to earn points. And part G isn't as bad as it seems either, okay? It's actually pretty important. L'Hopital's rule kind of involved there as well all right so look do the best you can okay um you know this is monday right here there might be another video of me doing a demo that might be tuesday you got to take home assignment due today i'm going to sign another one uh tomorrow on tuesday have it due friday i know it's a lot of work but i got to have you guys pumping out these problems okay and then after the ap things will be much less intensive in here certainly for the two weeks of ap's we're not doing anything you guys focus on your other ap's that you have to focus on and then we'll talk about what we have to talk about really i would not worry about it okay focus on this ap practice that 
demo okay let's practice it together we come back you know and then uh, i have a video explaining um or i'll just talk about it in one of my other uh videos anyway that's it so um you know have a safe and happy and a healthy one and look focus for another week guys for another week just focus okay you put in so much work you can do this, okay? Trust me. I know you people don't have confidence. You should. You really should, okay? There's people taking this AP exam. They have no idea what they're doing. They don't even know how to do the product role. I'm not kidding, okay? You know a lot more than you think. Just because in my class, you didn't score really, really that well. Well, that doesn't mean that you're not smarter than other people. I teach this class hard. It's not easy. So anyway, uh, keep putting in your work. Get in touch with me if you need to. It's coming up there, folks, okay? The countdown begins five days after today. Adios.